Congratulations on the exam. Again, I'm Larry Cook. Today's class, for approximately the next 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about the landing gear. Before I get into talking about the landing gear, I want to show you a couple of videos because they're not included in my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to show you a landing gear about our, I mean a video about our landing gear. What would you do if you lost the landing gear in the CH-47? What would you do in a Blackhawk or a, an Apache? The mattresses. The mattresses. If mattresses are not available, then you have to start thinking outside of the box. The next time you pre-flight the CH-47, look at the left or right aft landing gear. Just forward of the landing gear on the inside of the airframe, you'll see a little bell hanging down, bell-shaped piece of steel. That is for us to jack the aircraft up. You'll see why I'm saying that when I play this video. The second video I'm going to be showing you is ground residence. <clears throat> what happens when an aircraft goes into ground residence? On that video, the history behind this aircraft was in the 1998-1999 time frame, this CH-47 went into an unexplained barrel roll. They never could figure out what really caused it, so they sent it to Yuma Proving Grounds for a test aircraft. Now when this aircraft comes apart, that wasn't part of the testing. It went into ground residence, and we'll show you what the results of ground residence is. But this was just given to me probably about six months ago from a student returning from the desert. They called for mattresses, but where do you think you're going to get mattresses in the desert at? We know our landing gear, F landing gear, has our power steering. How it should be throwing hydraulic fluid everywhere right now. We'll show you why that's not happening. I don't know if they got it out there yet. They're going to try to put it down on pallets first. safety officer. <laughs> For real it is, the safety officer. No, the pallet started collapsing. So now they've decided that they have to bring the jack out. These guys are good. Again, that's a little bitty ball that they're trying to put that jack on. between the pallets and them.
it broke off on the inside there. As we go through the class, we'll talk about some of the things that may have caused that stress fracture. And then we'll talk about, you know, that was the right aft landing gear. We're going to find out that's where our power steering is. Why didn't hydraulic fluid fly, fly everywhere? And now I want to show you a couple of more videos. These are going to be reference ground residents. What do you do in the case of ground residents and you're on the ground? What do you do with the aircraft? Anybody know? Pick it up. was not intentional. I'll show you another view of it. Uh, Mr. Pilot, you've lost something. You'll notice that in front, they've got up front, they've got some cables there. It was being run remotely. Let's see. This is the rear view of it. See if you can pick out why this went into ground residence. Not good. I may have to show it a second time as it loads. Technical difficulties. I'll let it. Re I'll let it play, and then we'll rewind it, and then you can see it in slow motion coming apart. Let's see if we can see that in, in full speed. All right, here we go. Full speed. Starting to shake. They understand it now. You should hear the engines go back offline, but they waited too late. Yes, they are on regular wheels. There you go. That's what caused it. They're right there. They left their 10,000 pound tie down change to that. I point this out because this is a possibility. You're going to notice when you go to your unit and, and coming from AQC and coming from other airframes, mm -hmm. you should have had aircraft do a, a seven day run up or a 10 day run up if they sit on the flight line for so long. You get complacent. You know the aircraft's been pre-flighted, let's don't untie it, let's crank it up and run it. You can't do that. What causes ground residence is the, the, the shocks, the shock from the aircraft starting to shake, being on the ground, the ground's not given, and then the vibrations just start picking up between the ground and the aircraft, and it gets uncontrollable. There are a couple of re other reasons for ground residence, but that one was due to that, being tied down. Okay, now we're going to get to the meat of it. CH-47 landing gear. How many landing gear do we have? <coughs> we have four landing gear. How many tires we got? Six. So we've got six axles. We've got six sets of brakes. We've got four landing gear. Our landing gear themselves are air oiled and we'll discuss that as we go through. We land in several different configurations several different ways. Today's TLO, we're going to describe the components, operational characteristics, functions, and limitations of the CH-47 Delta landing gear in a classroom and your student handout. And then on the next test, you got to have four questions. You got to receive, get three of them to receive a go on this block of instructions. 
Safety requirements are none. Risk assessments low. Environmental considerations are none. And again, the second exam will have 90 minutes to complete this portion. LSA number one, describe the components, functions, limitations, and operational characteristics of the landing gear and brakes. Again, we have four non-retractable landing gear. Point this out because we've got a sister ship out there in the Navy, Marines, and I don't know if the, well, I don't think the Air Force have got any 46s. But he, my wife, that's how she identifies them as they fly overboard, overhead. Looks for the landing gear up front. We've got the four, they've got the three. Got dual wheels on front, aft wheels on, single wheels on the back. The wheels in the back will rotate 360 degrees. That is to facilitate our two wheel taxiing and to facilitate towing the aircraft during maintenance. They are air oil shocks, meaning that on the top side of our shock struts will be hydraulic fluid. The bottom side will be, hopefully will be nitrogen. And we're fixing to go into our hydraulics class, which this class is actually designed to be after our hydraulics class. But one thing we know about fluid is it's non-compressible. That's why we must put the nitrogen charge on the other side to let that be their point that expands and contracts to cover up for our not so pretty landing sometimes. Uh, we prefer nitrogen. Anybody got a good reason why we prefer nitrogen over air, shop air? The temperature change is affected a little bit or a lot more with the, uh, with the air. The, the that's the big key. Everybody hear that? The moisture accumulation. Nitrogen, the gas, will not let the moisture accumulate. Therefore, on the inside, we don't get rust, the pitting, <coughs> and our packings and bearings do not wear out that much. Some of the things that we're going to talk about over the next few minutes on the wheel brakes, parking brake, transfer valve, our master cylinder, our wheel brake assembly, and our pressure reducer. Everything in the utility system should operate off of 3,000 PSI, most everything. We're going to talk about nine subsystems. If I ask you a question come next Tuesday after we do utility hydraulics class, what does the parking brakes operate off of? You should be able to tell me that they're going to operate off of 1390. Again, the nine subsystems. But if you can remember two pressures, no matter what I ask you in the utility system, you should be able to answer it. 1390 for the brakes. In the utility system, there's one component, actually two components, but one system that needs 3350. Does anybody really know what that is? You haven't talked about the class yet, so it's no big deal. 3350? 3350. My APU motor pump provides me my 3350, but there's one important thing to my engine. So if you can remember 3350, I need that for my engine starts, and you can remember 1390 for my brakes. If I ask you anything else that you got to do with the utility system, I ask you what it operates off of, you tell me 3,000 PSI pressure. My brakes, I mean not my brakes, but my ramp, my power steering, my swivel locks, my power transfer units, uh, things like that. Anything else in the utility system, 3,000 PSI. Yes, sir? Can you say the number for the brake again? 1390. One, 1,390 PSI. It's a freaky deaky little number that somebody has thrown out there. And I'll show you how we reduce that 3,000 PSI down to the 1,390. <laughs> Some of the components, and hopefully by now everybody knows where this is at. That's back. Yeah. <laughs> we, You've got, a, you've got brake controls in the back by hollering over the intercom saying stop, and they'll stop. Our brakes in this aircraft will stop on a dime and give you 12 cents change. If you tell this aircraft to stop, it will stop. You've got a left and a right pedal. This is the co-pilot set area. Now I'm a country boy, and I'm ashamed to say I've never driven a tractor. Anybody here ever driven a tractor? Okay. My understanding is on a tractor, <clears throat> that if I apply my brakes left hand side the tractor is going to stop the left wheel and it's going to pivot around and you're going to turn. And this aircraft, since everything's been broken down left side, right side, number one side, number two side, if I touch my left pedal 
I'm only braking the left side of the aircraft, and I'll show you how that's accomplished. If I touch my right pedal, I'm only braking the right side of the aircraft. We need to be conscientious about when we apply our brakes. They need to be applied equally on both sides. That tractor had a pivot point. It could pivot. If I apply my left brake very hard on this aircraft, which, which landing gear does swivel for us? Aft. Aft. Our forward landing gear is not going to pivot. So if I hit that left brake pedal really hard and the aircraft tries to come to the left, that right forward landing gear is going to have a lot of stress and it's going to be pulled off the aircraft. So you need to apply the brakes evenly. Don't panic and apply one without the other. Our master cylinders, we've got four brake master cylinder, one under each pedal. Master cylinder just like a master cylinder in the car or truck or automobiles. The only difference I apply to this between our automobiles that are on the street and our helicopter here with power, uh, with hydraulic brakes, is your car has brake fluid, we have hydraulic fluid. But we've got a master cylinder and we've got disc brake pads. Mounted on the yaw pedals, you can apply them from the left side or the right side. Um, pilot and pub co-pilot cannot apply at the same time. They can, but this is the only part on the CH-47 where pilot authority takes place. And I, hopefully I will show you where pilot authority takes place. If the co-pilot's not braking fast enough or hard enough and the pilot gets excited, when he pushes his pedals, his or her pedals down, then the co-pilot's pedals are going to pop back up. On our master cylinders, you can see we've got a bleed port at the top. When we apply our brakes, pressure comes out the vent here, or the pressure port there. But we've got 3, 000, or 1390 PSI coming in, and we've got our return side going back out into the system. Here is a very busy schematic. I'm not even going to try to explain this schematic <coughs> other than if you sit down and take a look at it, follow it through. It shows you at the top where we reduce it from 3,000 down to the 1390, and it's really just breaking it down, telling us that we've got a left side, we've got a right side, and then it breaks the, the pistons down. Our brake assembly. Here is our brake assembly. Pretty simple. We've got six of these, six axles, four landing gears, six axles. This portion is tied to the axle, to the airframe. This does not move. This portion is inside the rim of the wheel. As the wheel turns, so does the disc. It's got slots in it, slots on the wheels that you'll look on the rim. When we apply our brakes, we're stopping the little disc pads inside here, which in turn press on these, just like our automobiles, and stops the aircraft. And again, I'm telling you, if you apply the brakes on this thing hard, it will stop. It will nose over on you if you're not careful, if you're taxiing a little bit too fast. What is our taxi speed? A brisk walk. Try not to exceed that. Inside the cylinder there, They're little pucks, brake pucks, just like our, cylinder, or our disc brakes in our cars. They've got the little asbestos or whatever they're using on the outside of it that allows it to keep from eating into our brakes. When you pre-flight it now, as we're, doing it, as we're doing it here on the flight line here, you go out, just make sure there's not really any metal-to-metal -metal contact. As you become more familiar with the Chinook, you'll learn to start looking for how much of this can be worn away. But for right now, all we're worried about is metal-to-metal -metal contact and that they stop us. Any questions about the brakes so far? Pressure reducer. This is how we go from 3,000 PSI down to 1,390. And back during the introduction, I asked you to get familiar with the 8 and 9 drive shaft. A picture of the slide that's on the board right now 
is our eight and nine drive shaft. This will be on the number two engine side, left hand, right hand side, about halfway down that little square box, you'll see this pressure reducer. If you're tall and your IP's tall, they can look at it and most of them will say this one says that it reduces it down to 1145 PSI. 1390 is what we've told the manufacturers we'd like it reduced down to, but this, you know, if they, if they say 1140, don't argue with them. It's 1390 PSI or whatever's stamped on the reducer. But that's in the back on the ramp area. That's where we reduce it from 3000 to 1390. It's not, it's not that other, the other port there is the one that goes to the cargo hook. No, sir, that's not the one for the cargo hook, but that's a good question. Before we get into cargo handling, see if you can find that valve. But there is a valve, looks a lot like this one in cargo handling, that allows the pressure release for our cargo hook. But again, our center cargo hook is going to be at 3,000 PSI. It, it's up a top. For those of you who want to start looking for it before we go to our cargo handling class, it's up top. Start looking for a valve that looks a lot like this. It's, this one's a pressure reducer. The one up top is, is a solenoid to allow pressure to go in and out. Our transfer valves. <clears throat> These valves are the ones that allow us, give us the ability for independent braking. I can brake the left side pedal, the right side pedal. When I push on either side, that's where I'm pushing the pressure down to my left hand side of the aircraft, number one, and the right hand side, number two. These valves you'll probably never see in pre-flight unless you get down in the chin bubbles and know exactly where they're at up in, up in the nose of the aircraft and look for them. They're behind that self-tuning vibration absorber in the nose of the aircraft when you pick that panel up and look in there. All you're going to see is a big black box. But behind that are the transfer valves that allow for the independent braking. Also inside the transfer valves is where the magic takes place for the pilot authority. We said 1390 PSI pressure comes in. If the pilot breaks the aircraft, there's or the co-pilot breaks the aircraft, there's 1390 PSI coming in this way. If the pilot breaks the aircraft, it's 1390 PSI coming in this way. Now those two pressures, if they both match, mash the pedals at the same time, those two pressures would pretty much cancel each other out. But on back of the pilot side, what I don't have in here, and hopefully I'll have a picture or slide for it shortly, there's a spring, pretty hefty little spring that just gives the pilot a little bit more oomph when they pushes his brakes and it will push the co-pilot's brakes back. About one or two inches of the pedals will pop back up when the pilot puts their brakes on. But that is inside the transfer valves. On page seven of your student handout, those little circles at the top, that indicates the spring that's inside. Our parking brake valve. What have you noticed about our checklist so far? Have y'all got to run the aircraft up and fly it yet? You've done the simulator though, right? Once you get the APU online, what's one of the first things you gotta do? Reset the brakes. Our parking brake valve works very well, but there are a lot of leak points in this aircraft. We can set the brakes and overnight, they may bleed off. The pressure may bleed off. So one of the first things you have to do is reset it. But this is where that takes place, where we lock that 1390 PSI pressure between this parking brake valve and our wheels. Without the parking brake valve being set properly, if you started to crank this aircraft up, it's going to taxi away from you because we know one of your flight control classes that you've taken so far with the tilt and the rotor system, it's there and it will start taxiing on you. I need to point out a few things on this. The parking brake handle. The parking brake handle is attached, to, it's got a spring attached to the back side of it. Your IP should have told you right now before you release the brakes, you grab the parking brake handle and ride it in. When you pull, when you set the brakes and you pull it back up real hard, I mean, because you're pulling against that spring, release the pedals and it's set. I caution you about this, about just pushing the pedals and not riding it back in. It will break the placard that says parking brake valve, which is no big deal. Flight engineer can replace that very easily. One of the big things that we're worried about breaking
is the micro switch. You'll notice that it says parking brake light micro switch. A little pin that sticks out, if you release the parking brake real hard, that handle was pulled down, it'll pop that micro switch. And then you're going to be left with annoying parking brake light on the whole time you fly. For me to replace that parking brake switch, I've got to bend down in there. I've got to be a contortionist to get into the pedal area where this is located to replace that parking brake valve. It would probably take somebody as large as I am four to six hours to replace that valve. And it's probably not going to happen. It's just going to, your, your parking brake light's going to be on and it's going to be very annoying until we get to a, a big maintenance function where we can take some downtime. So try to avoid it that way from breaking it. <coughs> There's your parking brake light on, your advisory light. If that micro switch is broken, that light will remain on. Our overhead control panel. I told you during the introduction, your dash 10 is going to refer to isolation switches. We're going to see this control panel three times today. There is nothing on that control panel that says isolation switch. But the one switch we are going to talk about today is the one that's marked power steer switch. That power steer switch will cut off the flow of hydraulic fluid to my brakes, my power steering, and my swivel arms <coughs> if I have a leak in any of those places. That is the switch when we watched that video that was probably thrown to prevent that hydraulic fluid from gushing out the uh, aft landing gear. Because if we had gone through our utility class like, we, like it was scheduled, you would know by now that our utility pump produces 3,000 PSI constant pressure, a variable flow of six, 0 to 16.5 gallons per minute. It's 2.17 gallons of hydraulic fluid in our reservoir up top. So that tells you when that landing gear broke off, if they had not been able to isolate that, that the fluid would have been dumped out that quick, and then it would have lost the pump. In with the brake system, we have a brake accumulator. Haven't been able to pre-flight yet, so you really may not know where this is at. You walk up on top of the aircraft, looking at the forward, standing behind the forward rotor head, that pile of forward pylons, what we call it. If you drop the left work platform, you drop it down, step inside and look towards the rotor head, right then on your right hand side will be the brake accumulator. The brake accumulator allows me, if I have to isolate the system or I lose a hydraulic pump, the brake accumulator allows me to have uh, four to five pumps for my brakes in an emergency situation. Again, if I lose a pump or I've had to isolate the system, this brake accumulator allows me to stop the aircraft. Now when we pre-flight this, you're going to be looking for um, anywhere from 6 to 1400 PSI reading on the gauge. The more pressure that you have on that gauge, the more pumps you're going to have. If I've got 1400 PSI or probably 1390 PSI on that gauge and I lose my utility system, then I'll probably got four to five, maybe six pumps out of it. If I've got 800 PSI showing on that gauge and I go fly the aircraft and I lose and I have to use it, I may have one, maybe two pumps to stop the aircraft. So look for it to be up higher. The pre-charge on that accumulator is supposedly 600 PSI. So if I'm looking at it and it says 600 PSI, there may not be any hydraulic pressure trapped at all in there. Or maybe the pre-charge is gone and that, that 600 PSI is a hydraulic pressure that's there. Look for 1400 PSI. It is a valuable tool. I'm gonna, I've heard Tom talk and re reference some of the C model stuff and again, if you can't appreciate what you've got unless you know what we didn't have. In Europe many years ago, I lost a utility pump. Didn't have this backup system. You try to shut this aircraft down without brakes, it's pretty hard to do. I got out there as a flight engineer. They would hover the aircraft, set it down. I'd throw chocks in. You get ready to just shut the aircraft down and it starts to roll over the chocks. Try it again. Got another set of chocks, put them on both sides. It'd roll over the chocks. Finally had to go get a large rock and then we've got it stopped. But this is something good. 
and it works very well. But you have to go, you have to go back to your overhead switch and you have to go, when you go to that off position, then it allows us to use the stored pressure that's, flip this switch, flip this switch up, go off, and then it allows us to use the stored pressure in our accumulator. Any questions about the brake accumulator? How is the pressure restored if it's too low? If the pressure's restored, how's it restored if it's gone? No, when it's low. When, when it's low, when you pre-flight and it's low, that would be, if I pre-flight and it's low, that would be a good indication for me that I need to check the pre-charge. Then I'm going to have to, what I would do is crank the APU. This is a procedure for the flight engineer or a pilot. Start up the APU. Isolate the system. Pump your brakes until you can't pump them anymore. That deletes the hydraulic pressure that should be in the system for the brake accumulator. I would go up top at that time and take a look at my pre-charge. That's probably what's happened is the pre-charge gone. If the pre-charge is reading less than 600 PSI, then they know they have to put a pre-charge back into it. If the pre-charge is reading 600 PSI, then the flight engineers are going to start having to troubleshoot it and there's a couple of check valves in the system that I'll show you when we do our utility hydraulics class that may not be storing that pressure in there for me. It's letting the pressure bleed back off. In that case, then they're going to have to fix it before you go fly. That's a good question. Any questions about the brake so far? Describe the operational characteristics of the power steering. Hopefully again, by now, everybody knows where the power steering control knob is at. It's located in the center console. Allows the aircraft to move left or right by using it. What I want to tell you right now is the little indicate the little tick marks that are on their center console mean absolutely nothing. They're a point of reference. It doesn't tell me that I'm moving five degrees to the left, five degrees to the right. They are just reference marks. You'll notice also on the center console you've got a steer switch, unlock, and lock. When I go to the unlock or the steer position, what AFCS feature did I lose? What was that, sir? Heading hold. So as long as it's in lock, as soon as I pick this aircraft up to a hover, we've lose the heading hold. Some of the power requirements comes off the number one DC bus, brake steer circuit breaker, and we, of course, we've got to have 3,000 PSI utility system pressure. We've got a power steering control module, power steering actuator we'll talk about. Again, we'll talk about the overhead switch panel, the steering control panel, and the master caution panel. Some of the components that we're going to talk about again, <laughs> our power steering actuator, our actuator rod, inside that rod is going to be another uh, be a component that I want to ask you about. The shock strut is really not designed to be talked about in this class, but while I have this slide up here, and it's on page 11 of your student handout, this same picture. Be aware that when you pre-flight this aircraft, the shock strut, if it had been in maintenance, could be locked out. This one is locked out, and I can tell by this picture. This little thing right here is an arm. That's a lockout pin. To prevent this shock strut from extending when I jack the aircraft up, this arm is taken from the 90 degree position or level position, brought up in a locking pin put in so that the shock strut does not extend. If you try to crank the aircraft up with this locked out, you can get into that ground residence that I showed you at the beginning of the class because the shock strut's not allowed to move like it should. So look for that during pre-flight. This arm should be down here with the locking pin installed into it. Again, this one is locked out. Upper drag link, our lower drag link. And then there is our power steering actuator. Relocated on the right aft landing gear. Now left aft landing gear does not have a power steering actuator on it, it will follow the right aft landing gear. Wherever the right aft landing gear goes, the left should follow. It's electrically controlled. It has a little hydroelectrical motor on the top of it. You've just got through talking about some other components that have had a hydroelectrical motor on them. 
Anybody remember what those were? Your, well, they've got electrical motor on. But your ILCAs on the extensible link portion, they've got a little motor on the side. Tells that actuator to go in and out. It's unlocked by hydraulic fluid. This one works a lot the same way. Inside the power steering actuator rod, there is another little rod on the inside of it. Tells it how far it's turned. When I tell it to turn five degrees to the left, that actuator goes out and says, okay, motor, I've turned five degrees, that's enough turning. And that's called an LVDT, linear variable differential transducer. You had linear variable differential transducers in your ILCAs, you've got them in your power steering actuators. Monday when we talk about utility hydraulics, we'll talk about another LVDT. But all they're doing is measuring the amount of movement, sending a signal back and telling something else. I've made the proper amount of movement that you've wanted from me. Also on top of the landing gear, there's an out of phase switch. On my slide, I was about to ask you what the limits of turning are, but my slide tells you. 58 degrees left, 82 degrees right. If I exceed any of these limits, an out of phase switch will, light will come on. I will lose electrical power to my power steering. The way to get out of that would be stop the aircraft, pick it up to a hover, reset my uh, switch on my power steering. I'd go back to lock and then back to unlock, set the aircraft down and try it again. If it does not work, then you lock them back and the aircraft be restricted from two-wheel taxi or four-wheel taxi. I said that it will come on if we exceed those limits. You as a pilot cannot physically exceed those limits or intentionally exceed those limits. If I turn that box all, if I turn that control knob all the way to the left, all I should be able to get out of the aircraft is 58 degrees. Turn it all the way to the right, 82 degrees. That being said, how can the aircraft exceed those limits while we're two-wheel or four-wheel taxi? Ruts, bumps, holes. The slant, the holes in the in the in the airfield if they're there or wherever our landing surface is. Uh, how fast did we say we could taxi? Risk walk. What if I've got the aircraft loaded with about 15,000 pounds in the back? I start exceeding that brisk walk. I turn to the left or I turn to the right. Could the momentum carry it a little bit further? Sure, it could carry it. Momentum will carry it. Most of the time you see that us lose that will be the momentum that carries us out. In the case, again, out of phase light could come on. Pick the aircraft up to a hover, control the aircraft first. Most important, control the aircraft. Recycle the switch back to lock, unlock. Go back to lock, set the aircraft down, go to unlock and then try to see if it'll work. It should reset, just like resetting a circuit breaker. Our power steering and swivel lock module located in the ramp area on the right hand side of the aircraft. someone's appropriated my training aid. Look for this and the next time you pre-flight you'll see that there is a solenoid on each side of this power steering module. One of them is for my power steering and one's for my swivel locks. I cannot turn both on in the Delta model Chinook at the same time. Charlie model Chinook I could. I could turn this power steering switch on, turn my swivel locks to the lock position and try to do that. But it won't happen in the Delta model. You can only have one or the other. And again, on this one, we have an accumulator. If I lose my swivel lock pressure, this accumulator will allow me to lock the swivels a couple of times to land the aircraft if needed. Has nothing to do with the power steering, the accumulator, it works with the swivel lock system. Again, there's our overhead panel. We need to talk about it again. It's the same switch. We talked about it when it operated the brakes. Now it's going to disable the power steering and the swivel locks. There's the control panel again. I've already covered those. It's got the swivel switch on it, three position, steer, unlock, and lock. The control knob, nothing more than reference. It's sprung loaded back to the center. 
So be aware of that fact. If you are taxiing and you sneeze and you let go of your handle, you're turning the aircraft, you sneeze, you let go of that handle, it's going to go right straight back to the center position and the aircraft's going to dance for a little while. It's, it's just one of the things that happens. Power steer caution light. Tells it comes on, tells us that our functions have failed. Again, that will come on. It, the out of phase switch will not turn on an out of phase light. It will turn the power steer light on the caution panel. That comes on. What we do with it, again, lift the aircraft to a hover, place the swivel switch to lock, land the aircraft and go back to the uh, swivel switch to the steer position and it should work. Any questions about power steering? Our swivel locks. Located on the right, left, and aft landing gear. These are very important. They lock the aircraft, they lock the wheels on the, the aircraft into the trail position. And what I'm talking about with the trail position of the aircraft, hopefully most everybody understands when I say that. But when I look at the left aft landing gear or right aft landing gear, I should be looking at the rim. If I'm taxiing forward, or I, my intentions are to taxi forward, I should be looking at the rim. If I see this, when I pre-flight the aircraft, on the outside of the aircraft as I walk up, then the aircraft is not in a trail position. When I try to taxi forward, the wheel is going to try to turn on me. When you walk out there and you see that it's not in a trail position, you've got to ask yourself a couple of questions. Can I pick the aircraft up to a hover where it's at? I can start the aircraft with it out of phase. That's what we call it when it's turned the wrong way. I can start the aircraft with it that way, but I am not going to be able to taxi with it that way. So you've got to ask yourself if you can pick it up to a hover. If you cannot pick it up to a hover, you need to call maintenance and let them bring their tow bar out and turn that wheel back around the right way. Because if you start to taxi forward, the wheel's going to turn sideways. The aircraft, the aircraft, you'll feel squat a little bit because there's a lot of pressure on that wheel. If you'll look at that, if you'll remember the video, they were going around a curve, it looked like on that video when they picked up to a hover and lost that aft landing gear. Nobody's told us what happened at that time, but you could tell there was a stress factor on the inside of that landing gear. And that comes from trying to taxi it, letting that wheel come out of phase. It turns sideways, and that's 31,000 pounds at a minimum of pressure put on that aft landing gear. And it causes, and it may not crack with you, but the next person that comes out there to pick that aircraft up, landing gear falls off. So again, have them to turn the wheel the right way if you cannot pick it up to a hover. These swivel locks, they're sprung loaded into the up position. It takes 3,000 PSI of pressure to push them down and make them lock. This would be sitting in the wheel area just like that. Located on top of the landing gear are two little snapping pins. They're angled on either side so that when the wheel comes around on one side, it pushes the spring down. When it gets to the back side of it, it pops up and locks it. The other side is flat, will catch it, and it will lock it in the trail position. If you're going to do a lot of practice run on landings, it's not a bad idea to ask the crew chief to make sure your swivels are locked before you land. All he's got to do is lower the ramp a couple inches and look at the aft landing gear, ensure that they're locked, and then you won't start dancing when you do that run on landing. And they keep it recentered. There are our power requirements, number one DC bus, brake steer switch, circuit breaker again, and we need to have 3,000 PSI from our utility system. Oops, going the wrong way. Also located in the top portion of the landing gear, this portion up here at the top where it swivels around. There is a centering cam, little heart-shaped cam. When we turn our power steering on, we allow 3,000 PSI of pressure to come into the hydraulic port 
pushing on the on that little wheel trying to center the wheel as long as pressure is back there it will push on that and it will center the wheel the reason I said earlier whenever you get ready to start the aircraft if you can pick it up to a hover that's fine you lock your swivels pick the aircraft up to a hover and that wheel will snap around because of the centering cam. It's always going as long as you've got your swivels locked, trying to keep it in the trail position, pushing it there. Was that, that, that view that we're looking at there is the same view we were looking at at the very end of that video? We're looking down inside that? You were looking down inside of that. It broke just, just below this where the centering cam is at. Power steering the swivel lock module again, same module we talked about a while ago when we were talking about our swivel locks, I mean our, our power steering. The lock position, again I asked you earlier what feature we lost if we took it out of locked, it should have been our, our heading hold, free position switch. <coughs> Are there any questions about the brakes, power steering or landing gears? Go back one spot. I sure can, sir. So, so when they're referring to, like in the top six, is lock position, swivel locks, lock, power steering, off. What, what are they referring to in here? Is like when I okay. Power steer switch. Okay, when I go to the lock position, what have I done? I've gone to the lock, I have locked my swivel locks, but, and I cannot. I've actually gone to my module back there. I've opened up the solenoid valve allowing the, the, the hydraulic fluid because you can't turn one on with both of them. I've gone back here to this module here when I go to the lock position. I've allowed the 3000 PSI to go through here and go to my swivel locks and lock them. But I also have de-energized the power steering. I can only send power to one of these at a time. So I go to the lock position. That, that tells me that my power steering is off. So what is the brake steer switch? Your brake steer switch is the one on the overhead uh, panel. Where it says power steer? Off on? Yes, sir. And let me see, what page are you referring to in your student handout? Uh, page 16. Page 16. It says at the top, the swivel lock accumulator stores fluid under pressure and should show us the swivel lock operation when the brake steer switch is off. Okay, yes sir. On bow legs B at the top on page 16, the swivel lock accumulator stores fluid under pressure for swivel lock operation when the brake steer switch is off. When I reach up there and I isolate it, say that power steering actuator blew a seal and I've had to isolate, oh, I could reach I could reach down there and turn my power steering off, go swivel locks. But if I reach up there and isolate the system with this right here, this allows that accumulator that's in the, on that module to now give me swivel lock operations until I land the aircraft. Flip this switch off, turn it off. I have to cut off power to where? Power steering, swivel locks, and my brakes. But I can't operate my swivel locks. Just like I can operate my brakes. Well. <coughs> if I knew where I was going, I'd be dangerous. There we go. I can't operate my swivel locks because just like my brakes, they've given me an accumulator. Stores some pressure under fluid, under, stores fluid under pressure for emergency operations. That should allow you to do a, a run on landing if you've lost an engine or you started losing hydraulic fluid and you blew that pump up. Where's that pump located at? Utility hydraulic pump. I know we haven't had the class, but we did introduction. Number one side of the, number one side of the, two side of the aft transmission. I know you were testing me out. Number two side of the aft transmission. 
if that pump fails and I really don't want it to come apart because it's located on my aft transmission and I do a run on landing, this is what gives me my swivel locks. Any other questions? See if there's any questions. Check on learning. Make sure I didn't miss too much. Will the swivel switch in the steer position? What automatic feature of the AFCS is disabled? Don't be afraid. Heading hole. The pressure reducer reduces system pressure to what PSI? From 1390, that freaky deaky pressure. The transfer valves allow what action by either pilot? And the answer to this one's going to be independent braking. It allows, those transfer cylinders allow, allow me to do the left or right pedal, but I really don't want to do that. I want to put the pressure down both sides. What is the maximum turn, turn radius for the aircraft left hand and right hand gear? 58 and 82. And again, that cannot be done with you doing it with the, with the control knob. It's the aircraft momentum that's going to carry it through those limits. So we talked about the brakes, power steering. Yes, sir. Um, how much pressure will be set on the brakes itself? The 1390. Okay. That's all that we allow. Once it goes through that pressure reducer back there between the 8 and 9 drive shaft, it breaks it down from 3000 to that 1390. I thought uh, yesterday our instructor told us uh, would only put like a 60 to 90 PSI on the brakes. Mm. So it prevents uh, from uh, brakes, you know, uh, split second jam. The 3090 is a lot of pressure. That is, that is a lot of pressure. I will get back to you, but as far as I know right now, once I apply the brakes, I'm allowing that 1390, whatever's in the system, to get there. But I will check into that and get you a good answer.